healthy body requires balanced neurotransmitter production. Modern marketing for antidepressant drugs has been so effective at co-opting not just the medical community, but also the alternative health circles, regulating bodies, and the popular media that most people now believe that they're serotonin deficient. This could not be further from the truth. In fact, most evidence points to population-wide excess of serotonin. And this serotonin overload is responsible for myriad devastating physical and psychological dysfunctions. The easy shorthand narrative about serotonin deficiency causing depression is not just lazy, it's fraudulent, completely inaccurate. Excess serotonin leads to overproduction of stress hormones such as estrogen, cortisol, and prolactin, and conditions the human body and mind to learned helplessness a phenomenon that's been demonstrated in animal research to trigger disturbingly acute suicidal behaviors. You don't need more serotonin, you need less. Serotonin is so important when we're talking about mental health. You need to philosophy. Regulate the social behavior by simply changing the balance of serotonin. The use of hallucinogens. Uncontrollable convulsions. The brain, the body, can be so jeopardized by these drugs. It goes against basically all the conventional wisdom that we've ever been told. But lowering your serotonin levels while increasing the production of dopamine and GABA is actually going to give you that feeling of well-being, clarity, and energy that you're looking for. Only 10 years after Prozac, the blockbuster antidepressant drug was approved for sale in the U.S. by the FDA. The Boston Globe reported that an estimated 50,000 people had committed suicide because of using the drug. Prozac acts in the brain as a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, meaning it blocks the reabsorption of serotonin that is sent out from the presynaptic neuron, leaving more serotonin to flood the space between the two communicating neurons, also known as the synaptic cleft. This mechanism of action allows for more serotonin to bind to the postsynaptic neuron's receptor sites, propagating the action of serotonin further than it would normally go in a healthy brain. So the term antidepressant that drug companies are using right now to market SSRIs is highly misleading. It's a complete misnomer because when you increase the circulation and activity of serotonin in the brain, it has the opposite of an antidepressant effect, which definitely would explain the rapid uptick in the suicide rate in the 90s after they introduced SSRIs into the market. In fact, the BGA, Germany's Food and Drug Administration, refused to approve Prozac in 1987, just a few years before Prozac's manufacturer Lully brought it to the US. German regulators were disturbed by the results of human trials where subjects who were previously non-suicidal experienced a five-fold increase in suicide rates and suicide attempts, compared to when treated with older maoi antidepressant drugs which actually had expired patents at the time. So why is serotonin still known as the happy hormone with all this damning evidence to the contrary? And why are these serotonin agonists still being prescribed by physicians? Let's wind the clocks back for a minute because there's a lot more to this story than most people know. The answer is hidden deep in the history of LSD. On April 16, 1943, Swiss scientist Albert Hoffman was resynthesizing a stimulant chemical that he discovered years prior by adding a functional group to a compound he extracted from a fungus in 1938, but had temporarily abandoned. Accidentally absorbing some of the chemical through his fingertips, he had to lay down and quickly experience what he described as an extremely stimulated imagination. In a dreamlike state with eyes closed, I perceived an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes with intense kaleidoscopic play of colors. After some two hours, this condition faded away. Hoffman, who was ranked in 2007 as the number one living genius of our time by the UK's The Daily Telegraph, had discovered LSD and three days later took the first full dose acid trip. The world was about to change. Sandoz Laboratories, Hoffman's employer, introduced LSD as a drug treatment for schizophrenia and alcoholism in 1947 in Europe. Soon thereafter, in the 1950s, things started getting weird. According to public disclosure by President Gerald Ford in 1975 through the Rockefeller Commission, a federal investigation into illegal CIA activities, the CIA had purchased the entire world's supply of LSD from Sandoz Laboratories and secretly introduced it into the U.S. Their focus was on mind control experimentation, with the chief aim of finding drugs that could be used in clandestine operations in order to wipe a subject's mind clean so it could be reprogrammed. For nearly a decade, the CIA experimented on mental patients, prisoners, sex workers, CIA employees, military personnel, and even members of the general public, almost always without the subject's consent or prior knowledge. According to now declassified CIA documents, the agency abandoned LSD experimentation in 1962 because it proved too unpredictable for achieving their mind control objective. Less than a year later, Sandoz Laboratories patents on LSD expired. 
By this point, writers such as Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, and Timothy Leary had begun openly advocating for the therapeutic usage of LSD and psilocybin, both potent anti-serotonin compounds, for the exact opposite purpose of the CIA's programs, to actually expand an individual's mental perception. After Leary and his research partner Richard Alpert, also known as Ram Das, were very publicly fired from Harvard University in 1963 for their experiments on LSD and psilocybin, the 60s counterculture movement in the U.S. started to pick up steam, with widespread use of psychedelic compounds in the general population, until 1968 when possession of LSD was made illegal by the federal government and then subsequently listed as a Schedule I controlled narcotic by the United Nations in 1971. Nixon's presidency from 1969 to 1974 marked an interesting time in the war on drugs, with the official establishment of the Drug Enforcement Agency, or the DEA, and a public declaration that drug abuse was public enemy number one in 1971. Which I think needs to be made to the nation. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Nixon is also quoted as saying that Timothy Leary is the most dangerous man in America. Leary, the inspiration for John Lennon's song, Come Together, was thrown in jail 36 times throughout his life, most often for marijuana possession, and ultimately for escaping prison before being recaptured by federal agents. He eventually ended up in California's maximum security Folsom Prison in the cell adjacent to Charles Manson. The two men have reportedly had a conversation about LSD, where Charles Manson is quoted as telling Leary, they took you off the streets so I could continue your work where Manson expressed frustration and difficulty in understanding why Leary had never used LSD for mind control purposes, rather he advocated for it to help people expand their minds quite the opposite. Manson, on the other hand, was well known for performing methods similar to the CIA's original experiments on his family to psychologically program them before the infamous murder of Sharon Tate. With such a huge focus on chemical-induced mind control by government agencies throughout this time, it might seem serendipitous that the 1950s and 60s also ushered in the first two generations of antidepressant pharmaceuticals, which could be more accurately described as tranquilizers. Physicians began prescribing these drugs to patients across the U.S. in mass. It's important to understand this. LSD is a powerful serotonin antagonist. With disturbingly analogous similarities to the reefer madness tactics employed by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in the 1930s, resulting in the federal ban of marijuana in 1937, the anti-LSD propaganda leading up to its prohibition in 1968 focused on claims that it induced homicidal violence. The first two generations of antidepressant drugs weren't the only thing that rose in popularity during this time but also specific serotonin precursor supplements, namely the amino acid L-tryptophan, 5-HTP, and the hormone melatonin. Dr. Richard Wertman, the MIT and Harvard doctor who discovered melatonin's hormone action in 1994, is quoted as saying that nobody should use melatonin as a dietary supplement due to known health risks associated with it. Yet, it continues to be sold over the counter and widely used by millions of men, women, and children. Misconceptions about serotonin and melatonin and tryptophan, which are metabolically interrelated, have persisted, and it seems that the drug industry has exploited these mistakes to promote the new generation of psychoactive drugs as activators of serotonin responses. If LSD makes people go berserk, as the government has claimed, then a product to amplify these effects of serotonin should make people sane. Serotonin itself wasn't officially discovered until 1935 when an Italian researcher named Vittorio Esparmer isolated a monoamine compound from enterochromaffin cells, which caused the intestinal walls to contract. He named this compound enteramine. Thirteen years later, researchers at the Cleveland Clinic discovered an amine in blood serum that appeared to act as a vasoconstricting agent. They named it serotonin. In 1952, scientists finally realized that enteramine and serotonin were the exact same chemical. In that year, MAOIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, were introduced by drug companies into the marketplace alongside the monoamine theory of depression in an attempt to artificially raise circulating levels of monoamines like serotonin in the body. 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut, contrary to popular assumption that it's all in the brain. Your gut is called your second brain, the enteric nervous system, for a reason. It contains roughly 500 million neurons. Your gut-based enteric nervous system communicates neuronally with your brain via the spinal cord, and bacterially via the production of certain gases to catalyze reactions and cascades within the body. Messing with gut function, especially neuronally, is risky business. Curiously timed alongside the war on drugs, the development of these serotonin amplifying pharmaceuticals built unstoppable momentum in the public relations sector, and they were embraced by government regulators as the antidote to mind-opening drugs like LSD and psilocybin, the anti-serotonin agents, which had already been proven too unwieldy for them to control. 
In 1950, two years before MAOIs were introduced to the general public, sociology researchers out of UC Berkeley published a seminal book entitled The Authoritarian Personality, the contents of which set forth their theory that, based on Freudian developmental models, people either developed a authoritarian personality or an anti-authoritarian personality, both of which have a biological basis. Authoritarian personalities are characterized by harm avoidance behaviors, unquestioning submission to authority figures, passive aggression, and extreme obedience, all behaviors shown in scientific research to correlate with high levels of serotonin. Quite possibly the most extreme and disturbing examples of serotonin's ability to induce the uh, authoritarian personality are seen in, in animal studies where they can literally use serotonin to induce learned helplessness. When exposed to excess serotonin levels, researchers can quite literally create learned helplessness in the animals, which creates this perception of extreme stress and pure hopelessness. And common studies basically uh, demonstrate this through swimming scenarios, where the non-serotonin group animals will quite literally swim for hours to stay alive. But when the serotonin group animals are placed in the water maze, they quickly exhibit signs of extreme stress, and they quite literally give up trying, and they allow themselves to drown. This is because they have no capacity to cope with this stress whatsoever. Researchers think that this type of learned helplessness occurs for several reasons. First, high serotonin levels tend to trigger the production of a lot of lactic acid via glycolysis, which interferes directly with mitochondrial respiration, as I've discussed earlier in this video series. This slows the metabolic rate significantly, leaving the animal with diminished energy. Second, panic reactions, extreme muscle pain, hypertension, and heart failure are all correlated with high serotonin levels. Anti-authoritarian personalities, on the other hand, are expressed through high dopamine levels and low serotonin, and are characterized in the individual through risk-taking behaviors, lack of obedience, and a disregard for authority figures. So it's logical why, on a population level, intelligence agencies, drug companies, and governments would be interested in declaring a war on anti-serotonin drugs. The 1960s were famously known as the counterculture movement, after all, and Timothy Leary was the figurehead, the most dangerous man in America. One interesting thing to note is that after MAOIs were introduced in the 1950s, incidences of migraines spiked, especially in women, and we now know why. Estrogen is an endogenous MAOI itself. The estrogen stimulates an increased rate of serotonin production. The excess serotonin has a vasoconstrictive action, decreasing blood flow to the brain, while veins and capillaries on the surface of the brain swell with blood, causing intense migraines and cluster headaches. MAOIs were eventually phased out of widespread use, mostly due to some pretty gnarly side effects in patients, but also likely due to patent expirations. Once a patent on a drug expires, it can no longer be controlled as a high-priced brand name and generally becomes a generic, lower-priced version of the same product. With the serotonin-driven consumer beliefs deeply entrenched in our cultural psyche, drug companies developed a class of new drugs with new patents to work on amplifying serotonin, the SSRIs. SSRI drugs such as Prozac were released in the 90s alongside aggressive marketing about how your depression is a deficiency in the happy hormone, and a lot of marketing around the idea of a chemical imbalance in your brain. Branded as antidepressants, SSRIs commonly demonstrate the exact opposite effect in patients, triggering unnatural suicides at alarming rates, including in depressed patients who were not previously suicidal. This is indicative of learned helplessness. SSRIs have been shown in ever-increasing mountains of research to cause serious side effects that mostly serve to make the patient's condition worse, including worsening of bipolar disorder due to negative neuroplastic changes, no improvements in major depression, no difference between SSRIs and control after a year of treatment. Placebos have been shown to provide better results in reducing suicide risks than SSRIs. There's been a 50% failure in SSRI trials, but published by the FDA and touted as 94% effective. There's been increased incidences of anxiety disorders, thyroid problems, increased stress levels, increased aggressive behavior, Alzheimer's risk, increased estrogen levels, mitochondrial dysfunction, and authoritarian harm avoidance increase alongside higher serotonin and prolactin, increased fear and anxiety, migraines, higher incidences of vascular disease and hypertension, and rapid decreases in blood flow to the brain. Another disturbing thing to note is that it's been found that roughly 50% of studies done showing negative effects of SSRIs go completely unpublished due to financial conflicts of interest between drug companies and medical journals. In cases of overdoses on SSRIs and 5-HTP supplements, people experience symptoms of serotonin syndrome with tremors, seizures, and heart failure. The antidote is anti-serotonin drugs, which will save the patient's life. Organs in the body, such as the liver and lungs, actually have innate defense enzymes, such as endoleumine 23 dioxygenase that are designed to destroy excess serotonin. 
However, in order for these enzymes to mobilize against serotonin properly, adequate carbon dioxide needs to be present. Therefore, the glucose metabolism is vital for lowering serotonin. Proof of consumption encourages the conversion of L-tryptophan into serotonin, which is one of the many reasons why I recommend avoiding PUFAs. The most common symptoms of excess serotonin are high blood pressure, gut problems and intestinal irritation, gynecomastia in men, aggressiveness, insomnia, low testosterone, low thyroid hormones, liver dysfunction, high stress hormones, depression, anxiety, sore muscles or joints, behavioral passivity and harm avoidance, lack of creativity, hair loss, fat gain, low energy levels, all of these are symptoms of hypothyroidism in general. Everything is connected in your body. Patterns present themselves and we need to pay close attention to them. For lowering excess serotonin levels quickly and naturally, I recommend the following dietary supplements. First, vitamin B3 as niacinamide. Second, L-theanine. Third, BCAAs. Fourth, amino acids such as glycine and proline, which are also rich in collagen and bone broth supplements. Fifth, activated charcoal. Sixth, mucunipurians, which is standardized at 15% L-DOPA. And for alleviating depression symptoms, I recommend also considering vitamin B9 as folate and magnesium as glycinate, citrate, or aspartate. I also recommend that you test for your micronutrient deficiencies because these deficiencies are actually what causes depression symptoms in the first place. And you should also test your blood for heavy metals like copper as well. The thermo diet food guidelines like eating raw carrots are inherently designed to properly regulate excess serotonin in your body. So please refer to these resources for nutrition suggestions. Pharmaceutical companies continue to pound false ideas into our collective psyche that we need to use their drugs to increase serotonin levels. We must work to lower serotonin production while simultaneously increasing production of GABA and dopamine, which is gonna restore the balance to the gut and the brain and it's gonna give you that feeling of well-being, energy, and clarity that you're looking for. When it comes to serotonin, it's time to think again.